She goes to pick up her youngest son from school in this fairly ordinary Buenos Aires working class neighborhood. Nothing gives away the fact that Victoria Montenegro has had anything but an ordinary life. In fact, for most of her life, the 34-year-old mother and wife of three sons thought she was someone else. Not Victoria Montenegro, but Maria Sol Tetzloft, the loyal daughter of an army intelligence colonel, Germán Tetzloft, and his wife, Mari, the couple who brought her up. Then, nine years ago, she discovered the truth that she was the child of Hilda Torres and Roque Montenegro, members of a left-wing guerrilla group. I was born on January 31st, and when I was 13 days old, an army commander raided the house where we lived. They tell me Colonel Herman Tetzlaff found me in a crater under the kitchen table and took me to a police station. There were more babies there from other raids too. Four months later, Mari and her man came to choose me because the babies were chosen and registered me as their natural daughter. Victoria's story dates back to what's known as the Dirty War, a vicious campaign carried out by Argentina's military dictatorship against suspected dissidents and subversives between 1976 and 1983. It was the height of the Cold War, and outlawed left-wing organizations were hunted down ruthlessly. So ruthlessly that an estimated 30,000 Argentines were detained, tortured, and never seen again. They're called the Disappeared. But the military didn't stop there. It also stole babies from the Disappeared, who were either taken from their mothers when they were captured and killed, or allowed to be born in captivity so they could be given away and raised to loathe the ideology of their biological parents. These missing children today are young adults whose real grandparents, in many cases, are fighting to find and identify them with the help of modern technology and the law. It's been nearly three decades since the end of the Dirty War, a period in which hundreds of children were born in clandestine torture centers, like at the former Naval Academy that you see behind me. No one questions anymore that all of that happened, but the debate that's raging today is whether the state has a right to force people to give up their DNA in order to prove their real identity. Thanks to a genetic data bank set up by Argentina's government in 1987, so far 101 missing grandchildren have been identified, but there are still an estimated 400 more unaccounted for, and many of those who were lost don't want to be found. That's why last November, Argentina's Senate passed a controversial law that allows authorities to obtain DNA samples from people thought to be missing children of the disappeared, even against their will. It was a major victory for the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo, the group that has been tirelessly searching for their missing grandchildren and campaigning for those who illegally adopted them to be tried and punished for crimes against humanity. We are talking about a crime against humanity, of a plan organized from within a terrorist state to steal children. So it's clear that our democratic state has the legal obligation to resolve those crimes. Caught in the crossfire are Marcela and Felipe Noble, who were born during the Dirty War and adopted by the wealthy owner of Argentina's most powerful media group, a harsh critic of the government. With the Clarín media group embroiled in an all-out confrontation with Argentina's current leaders, identifying the Noble siblings has galvanized public debate about whether the government is seeking justice or vengeance. <laughs> After so many years of impunity because of the media's power, I'm confident that finally, despite the immense, almost extortionist power over judges and politicians and businessmen and almost mafia-style power, we will overcome and finally know their true identities. The clear reference to their high-profile case prompted the 34-year-old Noble siblings to break their silence for the first time charging that there's no proof they were stolen and that they are pawns in a campaign of political persecution. 
No queremos sufrir más. No queremos que we don't want to suffer or to más. be hurt anymore. We also don't want to be hostages of a political attack. And for the government to use us to attack Larín. Is the president really interested in us? Or does she just need to show that our mother is the mother of the children of the disappeared people? But their plea fell on deaf ears. On May 28th, the Nobles siblings were followed home by police and forced to hand over their undergarments for DNA testing. If Marcela and Felipe Noble turn out to be who the government suspects, their adopted mother, Ernestina Herrera de Noble, would almost certainly face criminal charges of knowingly appropriating stolen children. For the last 34 years, we have lived with the blessing of a mother who chose us as her children, and we chose her as our mother. Nothing and no one can destroy that bond. The Noble siblings are at the heart of Argentina's controversy, over whether young adults have the right to privacy and to choose not to know where they came from, especially if finding out the truth means losing their current identities and watching the people who brought them up as loving parents go to prison. In the city of La Plata lives a woman who believes her right to find her grandchild is just as important. Chicha Mariani was one of the founders of the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo, and has spent the last 34 years searching for her missing granddaughter, Clara Anaí. Bueno, estos... This is my daughter-in-law, Diana. Diana Terugi. And my son, Daniel Mariani. Y la nena, and the baby, Clara Anaí. This is the house where Clara Anaí lived with her parents. On the 24th of November of 1976, it was attacked by a joint police and army commando using heavy artillery, heavy machine guns, and bazookas. All of the adults here were killed, but the body of the baby was never found. And according to witnesses, little Clara Anaí, who was only three months old at the time, was taken away from here by a police officer. Por eso, this is the typewriter we used to write the first letter to the Pope. Que pusimos en un buzón. Chicha is now almost blind, yet she continues to campaign to find her granddaughter, whom she believes could be none other than Marcela Noble, the adopted daughter of the media tycoon. The victims, and I am referring to Marcela, are also those of us who could be her family, who have been running after every child with a resemblance for almost a lifetime. It is very painful that people forget that we too are victims who suffer torture no one talks about. The pain of all the families who don't know where their grandchildren are and who cannot bury our own missing children, not even their bones. All these years, she's been collecting dolls and toys from all over the world to give to her granddaughter, she says, when she finally finds her. But she knows that she and other aging grandmothers like her are running out of time. Before I had patience to wait a month, two months, a year, but not now. I am angry that the trials, the decisions take so long. So many of the mothers and grandmothers have died without answers. I never thought that I might also go without knowing. For the paternal grandparents of Victoria Montenegro, time ran out. They died before their granddaughter was identified in 2001. She does have the letters her grandfather wrote to the Commission of Disappeared People during the long years he searched for her and her parents. We know that about 10 days after my little granddaughter was born, they were taken from their house by the army. Until this day, we've had no news of them. Our only illness is sorrow for not knowing the fate of our youngest son and our 20th grandchild. It makes me so sad, so many years of pain, of suffering. But Victoria is also familiar with pain and suffering. She lives just a few blocks from the apartment where she grew up. Her supposed father was sentenced to prison for stealing her in 2002 and died the next year in a military hospital. 
but Victoria and her family still pay frequent visits to his wife, Mari, whom her sons still call Granny. From the moment the police came to arrest Colonel Tetzlaft, the man she adored and considered her father, Victoria's life was turned upside down. I can't tell you how awful it was. I thought the charges are all lies, but I felt so guilty. The first time they took my father away, it was terrible. She still, perhaps unconsciously, calls him her father. Marisol, as she was called then, was desperate to protect him and refused to cooperate with authorities. But they eventually matched her DNA. The first thing I felt when they gave me the results was incredible shame. I was the daughter of subversives. And then automatically I felt fear that my father wouldn't love me anymore. My father, who had fought so hard against those terrible subversives, he wouldn't love me anymore. Little did she know then just how much her alleged father really knew. After the break, the shocking truth. kilometers away from Buenos Aires is the northern province of Salta, where Victoria's biological family comes from. <laughs> After years of refusing to have anything to do with them, Victoria now visits her large paternal clan as often as she can. A childhood photograph of her father, Roque, and her aunt, Irma, still hangs on the wall. I pray to God that if my brother and my sister-in-law couldn't be returned to us, that at least we could recover their child, because it's like recovering a part of them. Seeing them together, you'd think they'd been close all their lives. But sadly, there was to be no such bond with Victoria's maternal grandparents, who died in January. They never forgave their granddaughter for defending the army intelligence colonel who brought her up. The same man who confessed to Victoria that it was he who shot dead her parents. I know that he killed them, but I can't hate him. I know it's perverse, but I can't lie to myself. If he had been so bad to me, I wouldn't still love him, because I love him still. I'm not justifying for a second what happened. It has no explanation, no logic. I know it's terrible, but these are the cards I was dealt. Victoria is not the only one who knows what it's like to be torn between love and loyalty towards the people who brought you up and accepting the horrifying truth. This was my playground. When he was growing up, 33-year-old Alejandro Sandoval used to come here to play on the grounds of Campo de Mayo, the large military complex where during the Dirty War, thousands of political prisoners were killed. Many of them were thrown out of helicopters like these while still alive. This is the first time he's returned, since discovering two years ago that here is where he was actually born and where his mother died. Liliana Fontana was 20 years old. This is the place that gave me life. And I know now that I spent three months here with my mother. But it's very painful to be here, because I know it is the last place she was with me alive. When Alejandro was three months old, he was taken away by Army Intelligence Officer Victor Rey and his wife Alicia and raised as their own. Alejandro grew up carefree in this upper-class neighborhood of Buenos Aires, playing rugby and oblivious to the fact that his blood relatives were searching for him. This is the house where I grew up. Look, the sign that says be aware of dog that I put up when I was 12 is still there. 
but eventually the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo put the pieces together and came after his presumed parents. The only thing missing was scientific proof that Alejandro was the child of disappeared people. And like many others, Alejandro did everything he could to thwart the investigation and protect the couple he loved as parents. I was ashamed to be the son of disappeared people, and I felt guilty about what was happening to them. I was going crazy and did not understand what the reality was. I did not want my life to change. When he refused to voluntarily supply blood for a DNA test, prosecutors obtained a court order to raid his house and confiscate his toothbrush. During a subsequent trial last year, Alejandro testified in favor of Victor Rey, insisting that he had brought him up as a loving father. They gave me everything. Health. Nourishment. Affection, love, and principles too. Everything a good parent can provide. Still, the court found the man who stole him guilty. And Alejandro became a victim yet again. After the trial, he grabbed me and shouted, it is all your fault that they have sentenced me to 16 years in prison. It is all your fault. His wife, my supposed mother, also blamed me. And although I knew I wasn't the one who had committed the crime, I was devastated. They have not spoken since. And after the trial, his maternal grandparents rejected him too for having defended his appropriator. Now, Alejandro's only close blood relative is an uncle. His paternal grandparents are dead. In place of the families he's lost, he's become closer to the grandmother's group. I have a big family now. It includes all the grandmothers, and I have the fortune of having a hundred and one brothers and sisters. They are the other grandchildren that were recovered, just like me. We share the same experiences, so we can talk and understand each other. But Alejandro is still tormented by something as simple as his last name, a name he now loathes. When I introduce myself now, I say I am Alejandro Pedro Sandoval my real last name, but for 32 years my name was Ray, and because my appropriator, in his madness, appealed his sentence, I cannot legally change it yet. So you see, all my documents still carry the same name of my appropriator. I cannot even get married because it will be with the name of a person who isn't real. Every time I show my ID, it isn't really me. The issue becomes more powerful when you know your real parents are still missing. Very few of the remains that have been found of the victims of the dirty war have been identified. Alejandro and Victoria support the law that forces the missing children of some of those victims to provide DNA samples because they say it removes the guilt. They argue that because it's compulsory, the grandchildren aren't to blame for supplying evidence that could incriminate those who raised them. But the conflict between the right of grandparents to know, of grandchildren not to know, and the right to justice remains. Is justice an end in itself? Senator Norma Morandini, whose two siblings disappeared during the dirty war, believes the state has gone too far. It's compulsive. I think we have to respect the rights of these young adults to decide if they want to know. We need to build a culture of reconciliation, like other nations have done. I know it's an ethical and legal dilemma, but we have lost a great opportunity to build a national consensus, to begin to heal deep wounds of this country's dark past. Two years ago, with her family in Salta, Victoria celebrated her birthday for the first time on January the 31st, on the day she was really born.
Since then, she stopped calling herself Marisol, and she has begun using her real name. And the conflict over her identity has also impacted her family. Her three sons have had to change their maternal surname. Victoria's husband, Gustavo, was instrumental in getting her to accept who she really was. But he himself is having a difficult time adjusting. It's hard for me to call her Vicky. I call her Sol, or her nickname, Negra. It's hard for me to make the switch, not because I don't want to but because it is not the same name of the person I married. Physically, she is the same, but she is different. She's changed. Who do you prefer, Sol or Hilda Victoria? Hilda Victoria. The thing is, Hilda Victoria is hard to adjust to in some things. Victoria has a job now. Sol used to stay at home, was less outgoing. It's different, very different. It's been a long, torturous process, Victoria says. But once you know the truth, there's no going back. If I had a magic wand, the only thing I would change is for my parents to have never disappeared. That's the only truth I would alter. I'm rebuilding my life with the name my parents chose for me. My biggest regret is that my grandparents died before I found out who I really was. I know others like me are afraid to come forward because of the consequences. But being able to recover your identity and finding your real family, it's worth it all.